it's harder to lead a political party without having a seat in office. So, when the writing that the newly minted leader of the Green Party of Canada ran in last time came open, Annemie Paul leapt at it. And although she didn't win, she made huge gains this week in that Toronto Centre by-election to replace former Liberal Federal Finance Minister Bill Morneau. And that was less than a few weeks after winning her party's top job, no less. With us now to reflect on her very busy month of October and beyond, there's Annemie Paul in the provincial capital. Hi, Annemie. Hello. So excited to speak to you. Um, you know, you had quite a busy month. At the beginning, you were chosen to be the federal leader of the Green Party, and you made history as you became the first black permanent leader of a major federal political party in Canada and the second Jewish person to lead. Can you take us back to those last few moments before you found out that you won and what it felt like when you realized that you did win? Uh, you know, there was a lot of drama. We we had this very complicated system uh, where we were going to find out um, if we had won or not, and there were significant delays. And for a while there, we thought that we had lost. And so I was just walking around the room reassuring people um, that it would be okay and life would go on. Um, and we were taken down. We still didn't know. I mean, we you know we we got the results when when others did. And it was emotional, you know, it's during COVID, my mom wasn't able to be there, my son was not able to be there. Uh, so it added, I would say, some additional emotion to the moment. Uh, it hit me just for one little second and I didn't have much time to think about it afterward, but that uh, something historic had happened and that was really, um, you know, whatever else happens, there's this little thing that has changed forever in Canadian politics and being a part of that, that was, that. I think that's the thing that um, really, really hit home at that moment. It was very emotional for me. You know, it seems as if you've been working towards this moment your whole life uh, when you look at your resume. On a personal note, what did it mean to you to make history? Yeah, I um, went, the first thing I did after I finished graduate school was to come back to Canada and to found uh, an institute focused on advancing knowledge and also getting more people of color, people from marginalized groups elected. Uh, so I think that I, you know, I understand more than most what a difference it makes. Uh, it's not just something that feels good, and it does feel good, but it's something that really changes the political landscape. It gets voters involved. It gets people, it keeps our democracy strong. And so for me, knowing that uh, I had made it easier for people uh, that hadn't seen themselves reflected to imagine themselves in politics, whether elected or otherwise, uh, that is wonderful. And that is something that uh, that everyone in Canada should feel good about. And I definitely do. Well, after you became leader, the campaigning didn't stop. Uh, you jumped into a by-election for a seat in Toronto Centre. That seat has been a Liberal stronghold for some 25 years. Why Toronto Centre? Actually, 27. It's been held uh, uninterruptedly for 27 years. And this was just, uh, I describe it really as, as a matter of the heart. You know, this, I, I ask everyone, what would they do? You know, if they had run previously in a riding, if they had uh, been born in a riding and their family had, uh, had spent most of their working life in that riding, and if you'd seen it in decline, and if you had an opportunity to use your newfound uh, role to try to help and to offer a real choice, what would you do? You know, I, I for me, there was only one option, and that was to run. And so I knew that it was going to be really tough. The whole team did, but uh, that that's never deterred Greens from uh, putting themselves forward. And I, I have absolutely no regrets about it. It was absolutely the right thing to do. Um, seeing that you do have a personal connection to the riding, how did you take the loss then? Well, I, you know, even you, you look, we we wanted to win, and that's it's something that's very important for people to know. We were definitely running uh, to win, um, but what I do know is that the race was a lot harder. Uh, that all of the parties, the major parties, had to take it much more seriously because we put up a very strong um, um, uh, race. You know, we were very competitive. Uh, it meant that everyone needed to pay attention to the issues. I know that it means, and I congratulate Marcy on winning, but I know that it means that uh, she's going to have to work that much harder uh, because people in Toronto Centre sent a very clear message that they do want change. 
and uh, whoever represents them has that little bit of extra um, impetus to make sure that they get it. So that's already a win for people in Toronto Centre, even though I didn't win. We've been hearing a lot about um, uh, uh, people who are frustrated with how politics looks right now um, mm -hmm. and uh, the criticism that uh, there's a lack of civility in politics. Why did you congratulate Marcy? Because I, I, at the end of the day, if you if it's really about the people, then whomever they select, you want them to succeed. And uh, Marcy is uh, is someone now who is the member of parliament for Toronto Centre, and I want her to succeed. Uh, I want to make sure that if I can help her, or volunteers who live in Toronto Centre can help her, uh, that they do. And also, you know, it, it's just good manners. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my family, we're from little islands in the Caribbean. I was born here, but they're from little islands in the Caribbean. And, and good manners is just part of the way I was raised. So... Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, the NDP and Liberals chose to run candidates in the race, uh, ignoring what is known as leaders' courtesy. Your former leader, Elizabeth May, criticized NDP leader Jagmeet Singh, saying he was blocking your historic entry into the House of Commons. What did you make of that? Uh, you know, I, I understand, you know, Elizabeth is, um, is fierce and wonderful. And uh, certainly I wasn't um, part of the Green Party when uh, we stepped aside to, to uh, support Jagmeet getting into Parliament. Uh, but I can understand that frustration that she and others have had. I knew there was going to be a full slate of candidates. I did not ask any of them to step aside. Uh, and I believe that, you know, again, we, we vaulted over all, all of the candidates, save one, and so it shows that we're competitive, even under the, the usual circumstances. And just as someone who's made history very recently and had to knock down a lot of barriers to do it, uh, I don't. Uh, I know I'm going to get there one way or another, and uh, you know nothing is going to prevent that from happening. Do you think that May should have resigned herself and let you run in her riding instead? No, definitely not. Um, we're only headed in one direction, and that is up. That's growth. And so I wouldn't want to substitute an outstand myself for an outstanding parliamentarian. I'm looking to join her uh, as opposed to substituting her. So yes, you know, they the people in Sandwich Gulf Island, they love her. She's done a fantastic job. She's been uh, elected three times there. No, I'm not uh, I'm definitely not looking to uh, to uh, to take her place there. Will you take a shot somewhere else if the opportunity arises? Well, this is, you know, the Green Party, one of the things that sets us apart is that uh, the leader is not the one making all of the decisions, not even about their own lives. Mm -hmm. And uh, so in my case, it's going to be a discussion early next week, uh, beginning next week, with our caucus, with our leadership, uh, with our members about where and when it's going to make sense for me to run next. I'll definitely have my thoughts, but uh, it's such an important decision for the whole party uh, we want to make sure that we get it right. And so we, we have to look at all, just the whole lay of the land before uh, deciding, and we have to do it together. I know it's been done before, but um, doesn't it make your job harder if you don't have a seat? It's been done before, as you said. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I, I, they're, they're, you know, they're, it's a mix. It's really a mix. Um, you know, the day after the by-election, on the one hand, I thought, you know, it's, it's, I, I wish that I was going to, to Ottawa. I wish that I was going to represent uh, the, um, the residents of Toronto Centre. Uh, it certainly would be nice to be with my caucus. But on the other hand, there's still a lot of building to do. You know, we're a major party, uh, but in some ways we're still a startup. And so having the, the freedom uh, and flexibility not to have to work around committee work and, and other parliamentary work or constituency work, uh, that also has some advantages as well. So either way, uh, I was going to make the most of it, and I'll definitely find a lot of ways to build the party until I get a seat. Um, and just to push back a little bit, um, don't you think, mm -hmm. though, that you not having a seat there is going to make it harder for you, It's you your ability to hold the, uh, the government accountable? Well, we have a caucus, and um, they're doing a very good job of that. And certainly, you know, we meet a couple times a week to talk about um, our positions that we're going to take, our statements that we're going to take. And, you know, one of the advantages for the Green Party of having a leader that is in Toronto is I have uh, much more ready access to the media than Elizabeth did out in BC. And I'm just, uh, you know, three, four hours away from Ottawa if I never ever need to uh, have a press conference there. 
So I, I have uh, I have opportunities to make sure that our voice is heard, our views are heard, even if I'm not in Parliament. And of course, Parliament isn't functioning in the way that it, it normally does in any case because of the pandemic. Elizabeth, Elizabeth May was leader for 14 years. Um, mm -hmm. Has she given you any advice about your role, your new role? Sure, and and having her there is just a huge benefit. She, not only was she the leader for so many years, but she has such an extraordinary wealth of institutional knowledge about Parliament, uh, about his procedures, and so having her there, having her uh, be our parliamentary leader until I'm able to get in is is just a, a bonus. And we're in regular touch, as I said. I speak with the caucus every couple of days. Uh, and uh, I made it very clear to Elizabeth I'm going to keep tapping into uh, that knowledge base for as long as long as I can. And I know she wants to run in the next election as well, so uh, I'm going to have access to that for a long time. Well, before your win, um, in an interview with the Toronto Star, May mm -hmm. said that she wouldn't rule out running again as leader, and also said that the and also said uh, the Green Party is defined by the grassroots formational policy, and there are no whipped votes in Parliament. The leader has very little scope to set policy and won't be able to direct her and the other uh, two Green MPs in the House of Commons. And this is a quote, you're the chief spokesperson, you're not the boss. Uh, it's important, again, to note that she said that before you were selected, so it wasn't directed at you. But now that you're a leader, does that undermine your ability to lead the Green Party? Well, you know, we have a, a great relationship, and I will say that, you know, all of those things are, are correct, and and uh, the Green Party is a different party. Uh, we work by consensus. These are things that, that really were uh, initially or traditionally, historically, had been a part of our parliamentary democracy and have just been undermined over time. Uh, we, you know, the leader of the party is not supposed to have all of the power. The leader of the party is supposed to, as much as possible, work by consensus. And we have a member, a member base, and they're the ones that drive our policy and our policy development process. And so I, 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 these are the reasons I joined the party in the first place. I really celebrate them. I think that they're very healthy for the democracy um, of our party, but also democracy in general. And I'll tell you, this is how good public policy happens. It does not happen when all the ideas and all the initiative comes from just one person. What will be your top priority now for the Green Party? Uh, it always has to be winning more seats. You know, green, Greens, uh, we have an exponential impact on policy uh, as, as is, uh, but every time a, a new Green is elected, we get the opportunity to have more impact, uh, to be a, a bigger voice in the room when decisions are taken. We're a political party. And so my goal really uh, between now and the next election is to help create the, the conditions that are going to allow us to win more seats. Um, I wanted to go uh, part, uh, over some of your plan, and here's part of what your plan says. Reinforce our national carbon tax and rebate program. Introduce a border carbon adjustments mechanism. Invest in deep retrofits, clean tech, large-scale green infrastructure, and carbon capture technology. Why are market-based solutions the way to go? Well, we want to, you know, we have a very short period of time uh, before before we run out of time in terms of tackling the climate emergency. Uh, it's still very concerning to me and our members that uh, the government has not uh, chosen to uh, to identify and and fix uh, targets that correspond to the science and uh, to put a plan in place to get us there. And so I'm very excited when I see those slides. I'm very excited because we can see that uh, we have the opportunity right here, right now, under our existing system to do so much uh, in the 10 years that we have left to really uh, reduce our greenhouse gases by at least 60%. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, those these are all innovative things. We have some world leaders in Canada in all of those areas, and the Green Party wants to see, see those things happen. These are not, by the way, none of these are exclusive. You know, if there are new um, if there are new strategies that come along, new innovations that come along, this is one of the things about the Green Party. We're ready to embrace them, but we know that those three things that you mentioned are some of the most uh, impactful things we can do now uh, to tackle the climate emergency. Well, some of these uh, proposals are similar to what the Liberals promised in their recent throne speech. How do you distinguish yourselves from them? 
Well, as I said, the Liberals have, they have no plan and they have no target. Uh, you can't get to where you're going if you don't even acknowledge uh, where you need to get. Mm -hmm. um, the Liberals did not propose a, uh, and this was one of the reasons we could not support the speech from the throne. The targets that they have are targets that they inherited. They're 50% of what they need to be uh, to get us, um, uh, get our greenhouse gases uh, reduced to the point where we can um, prevent glo uh, runaway warming, global warming. Uh, they did not propose a carbon border adjustment. That's a that's a very um, impactful innovation that uh, that was not in there either. Um, their carbon tax is is wonderful and it's something that we proposed before they did. Uh, but of course, they need to make sure that they are increasing it at regular increments. Uh, until it um, it is uh, produces its efficiencies, and they did not. That was also not mentioned. So, uh, in all of the respects, if you look at all of those bullet points, and if you look at our climate targets, uh, the Liberals and I are still very well. Not I. I'm so sorry. The party. The Liberals and the party are still very, very far apart. Um, during the campaign, you talked about uh, experiencing racism and anti-Semitism. And of your party, you've actually said, and this is a quote, uh, there is no question that the Green Party has work to do in addressing racism, anti-Semitism, systemic dis discrimination in all its forms. How do you move forward in addressing that in your own party while also navigating it day to day? Well, one of the things that uh, that the Green Party did when they elected me was to say we agree. Uh, we agree that uh, that um, uh, we we want to address diversity in particular. Uh, we uh, need it. We didn't run a very diverse slate of candidates, for instance, in the last election. And you know, as long as I have uh, some time to work on that with our membership and with our council, we're going to definitely do better the next time. Uh, everyone, as, as everyone, as far as I can tell, or almost everyone, is very supportive of the objective of making sure that the Green Party reflects the true diversity of Canada. And so that work, I think, will, you know, it's already uh, underway and it's going to continue. And I think that uh, I have a lot of support in doing that. And then if we can reflect that internally, then it's something that we can encourage externally as well. There's no question that having someone that looks like me with my lived experience at the highest level of politics in this country is going to make it easier to have those conversations. And I'm certainly going to make sure that those end up on the, uh oh, here, I'm gonna say it, on the agenda. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, it's not identity politics. It's really just what we need to do to keep our democracy healthy and strong. It is something that we all should be invested in because we all benefit from it. Um, I'm going to set my objectivity as a journalist aside, and I hope the audience can give me some grace in this, but I'm ready to take it. Um, I think it's so significant that you are um, the first black uh, leader of a, a party in Canada and that you are a woman. So, and for me to ha be able to talk to you, it's just like, it's, it's such a, I, I'm thrilled. Um, you are the first black person to lead a major party and you're the first Jewish woman. Do you feel a certain pressure to represent both of those communities as leader in Canada? Well, first I'll say right back at you. You know, because I don't get the chance to be interviewed very often by a black woman. You know, this, there are still a lot of mountains to climb and a lot of professions that really matter, you know, that matter and that have a, a very important role to play shaping the dialogue. Uh, and at, with that, I'm going to have to ask you to ask the question again, because I was so focused on how proud I am of you. <laughs> I didn't oh. hear the question. I'm going to start crying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you feel the pressure to represent both communities? Uh, I do, and I, it shouldn't be that way. You know, it shouldn't be that way for you or for me. We are we, you know, our communities, communities, because it's a diaspora and we don't all come from the same place. But the black communities are, you know, we're we're not a, a monolith, and uh, you know, we saw that recently. You know, we had Dr. Lewis who ran for the Conservatives. Uh, at the same time that I was running for the Green Party, I think we can all agree that there are many. Uh, significant political differences between our two parties, yet there we both were. And so uh, it shouldn't be that uh, whether I succeed or fail will have an, you know, a lasting impact on the chances of other uh, women like myself that put themselves forward, but we know that it does. 
And so certainly I do feel that responsibility to do well. I do feel that responsibility to make sure that it's easier for the next person. Uh, and I'm going to try my, my very best to do that because I do want this door uh, to be permanently open. And you know we, we know that's not the case. We had a lot of female premiers not that long ago, um, a real much more gender balance, and that's gone. All of our premiers now, with the exception of uh, um, our premier in the territories, uh, they're all men, they're all white. Um, all of our leaders, save me, at the federal level of the major parties, they're all men. And so we can't take for granted that these doors remain open, even you know once we've gone through them the one time. Well, congratulations, and hopefully now you'll get some rest. Uh, <laughs> maybe have some candy, <laughs> overdose on candy this weekend. Um, we really appreciate your time, Enemy. Congratulations. Oh, thank you so much. It's, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, I feel, you know, really at home with the agenda, and uh, I hope you'll invite, invite me back again really soon. Definitely. Take care. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.